No One Lives Under the Lighthouse, originally released in April of this year through indie developer Sawoke Entertainment Bureau, is a short retro horror experience that tells the story of a lighthouse keeper having a bad time. Taking inspiration from the fifth gaming generation's 32-bit visual style, No One Lives Under the Lighthouse sits comfortably within what has come to be affectionately known as the haunted PlayStation 1 genre of gaming. Wonderfully retro graphics to elicit a wonderfully memorable PS1 horror experience. And sure, it was never actually labelled a haunted PlayStation 1 title, or at least not in any capacity that the wisdom of the Google search engine decided to offer, but the intended sentiment is obvious throughout the game's entirety. Every frame of No One Lives Under the Lighthouse feels reminiscent of an era that just OG Resident Evil's the shit out of me. What a mansion! The blocky, entirely 90s visual design is one that, when utilised correctly, can be extremely effective, as has been recently proven by the likes of Arbitrary Metrics Paratopic. And while it's never going to win any awards for the PlayStation 5 or Xbox One supreme graphical realism, it obviously never intended to. In fact, again when utilised correctly, the aesthetics of the haunted PlayStation 1 movement can be perfect for a project that hinges on horror and tension. There's a certain unique surrealism that the PlayStation 1 graphics offers that just feels otherworldly, and these are all key elements that No One Lives Under the Lighthouse honestly has in abundance. So as previously mentioned, after witnessing a suitably mysterious introduction that I'm not going to spoil just yet, No One Lives Under the Lighthouse focuses on a late 19th century lighthouse keeper, a concept that will no doubt be familiar with any fan of Robert Eggers. Yes, this game probably took certain inspiration from the lighthouse, and if it did, I'm perfectly okay with that. As long as Willem Dafoe doesn't accuse me of not being fond of his lobster. <laughs> Moving swiftly on, after briefly explaining that the original Keeper went missing, the game sets a player loose to pick up where they left off with a simple objective. After being promised that an assistant will be delivered to you within the next week, your currently solo venture as the Keeper of the Island is to ensure that the lamp is lit every night and remains lit until dawn. A simple, yet crucial role in the world of maritime navigation. I love the sound design of this game. If I were to stand at the top of a cliff and close my eyes, this is exactly what I would expect to hear. And it doesn't stop there. The dull thump of your footsteps on wood flooring, the clunking clock keys in the cabin bedroom, hell, even the buzzing of flies in the outhouse, it all sounds perfect for the game's setting. Yeah, it might sound odd to take note of something as specific as flies enjoying the presence of shit, but when you opt for a retro visual design, it's the little details that really matter. And speaking of the little details, initially the game feels very purposefully slow, gradually building a sense of unease with hints that something unusual has occurred, such as the previous keeper's carelessly discarded oil can, a questionable black sludge on the cabin floor, or the mysterious locked chest. And while no one lives under the lighthouse could be very easily mistaken for nothing more than a walking simulator, this is thankfully not the case. True, there are a few recognisable traits throughout the game that link back to that genre, but this is still first and foremost a horror experience. And it acts like it. As your days continue, strange distractions from your work will start to occur. You may notice that the lighthouse lamp sandbag counterweight is now missing, or the rowboats have been disturbed, or the death and apparent burial of a seagull. And with every new event, the feeling that somebody else is on the supposedly deserted island continues to grow. You may find yourself standing on the lighthouse balcony, scanning the figureless land below, or wandering to the other side of the island, only to find dead trees and rocks instead of something more interesting or dreadful. 
It is, as far as you can tell, an empty rock in the middle of the ocean. And ultimately, regardless of your distractions, you must still ensure that the lighthouse lamp is lit at night, even if it would appear that something doesn't want you to. And this is where I'm going to throw up the old spoiler warning. I've probably said too much already, and I honestly think you should play this game as blind as possible. If you want to skip the spoilers, here's a timestamp to jump ahead. If not, it's time to talk about what the hell is actually going on here. So to rewind to the very beginning of the game for just a moment, No One Lives Under the Lighthouse doesn't just explain that the previous Keeper went missing, you actually play through the few last minutes prior to their final moments, alongside witnessing an eerie figure that hovers ominously in the basement. In spite of its appearance, the Keeper doesn't react with any obvious surprise or terror. In fact, when you check it, the door to the outside is locked, and after the previous Keeper calmly lights the lamp, the scene then shifts to a distant view of the slowly rotating lamplight, which then abruptly cuts out before the scene smash cuts to daytime, revealing the introduction of the replacement Keeper player character. With this, and the eventually more aggressive attempts to disrupt your work in mind, it's clear that the player character is being stalked by something, and what it ends up being might just surprise you. Yes, it's a moth man. Terrifying, I know. Uh. However, yes, this thing is hardly the most intimidating monster in video game history. Frankly, the first time it appears, chasing you from the point of view of the monster's perspective, it's kind of cool, but I actually hated it compared to all the other things that I loved about the game. The beautiful shots of torrential rain, or the thick grey skies before the last rays of sunlight disappear, or the genuinely unnerving appearance of hundreds of moths smothering the lighthouse windows. All that work, all that amazing, wonderful work to build the kind of tension and atmosphere that I absolutely adore in horror media. Damn, they have ruined by this fucking thing. But, thankfully, No One Lives Under the Lighthouse doesn't end here. There's more to Captain Mothface than just a PlayStation 1 beastie that slender chases you around before killing you. Because this game isn't just a horror experience inspired by 90s visuals and 19th century maritime safety precautions. It's also a Lovecraftian one, with multiple endings, and some good old fashioned cosmic horror. So although I'm not going to get into every ending that the game offers, purely because I'd like to leave a few things hidden if you do choose to play it, one of these endings involves the player being chased by the Mothman into a huge labyrinth beneath the island, which admittedly is the worst moment of No One Lives Under the Lighthouse from a gameplay point of view. It's fucking infuriating trying to maintain the sense of direction in this place, but you do witness the beginnings of what will become a far larger example of cosmic horror. Some of these tunnels warp unnaturally around you as the player sprints down them, distorting in shape and size as if you were transitioning from one dimension to another, which as it turns out, is not all that far from the truth as you fall down a hole and come to find this. From this point onwards, No One Lives Under the Lighthouse had suddenly become an entirely more intriguing experience. Sure, I'd loved a lot of what I'd come before, grievances towards Mothface aside, but this? This was just straight up fascinating. Exploring the pyramid, you come across a set of levers to trigger several platforming configurations, which then assist you in reaching the bonfires, which then send a huge beacon of light upward when lit. And you also come face to face with a number of fossilized semi-reptilian worms. As far as you can tell, the worms are lifeless, yet the faces hidden behind the large coins all still appear pink and fleshy, with just the tiniest indication of humanity. And as with the coins themselves, they fit into the slots located 
on the chest. Oh. That chest? This isn't going to end well, is it? So, by this point, the entire story of No One Lives Under the Lighthouse is starting to become very clear. Every keeper to have previously gone missing has, in some form or another, eventually been lured or chased by a mothman into the tunnels, to then fall into the pit and discover the pyramid. After doing so, the lighthouse keeper is doomed, falling to temptation and opening the chest, thus fulfilling the wishes of the entity that dwells beneath the lighthouse. The lighthouse keeper is then cocooned and incubated in worm form, before finally bursting from the worm as another mothman, a minion of the entity, charged with the purpose of continuing the cycle of luring or chasing the next replacement keeper, and so on and so forth. Unless, of course, a lighthouse keeper succeeds in breaking the cycle, but you're gonna have to find that out for yourself. Like I said, there are multiple endings here, but the worst of them is also likely to be the first that you achieve, and also the most Lovecraftian of them all. The body horror of the cocooning, the eldritch entity beneath the island, the insignificance of the efforts of man compared to a larger cosmic power or horror, the frankly cultish behaviour of the establishment, who continue to deliver solitary keepers to the island in the face of the obviously strange situation at hand, an element of the story heavily hinted at through the imagery of an undetermined escapee leaving the island Island with a chest of light, to then the scene abruptly shifting to instead show the old man delivering the newest keeper to the island, supposedly in return for implicated fortune and riches. These are all familiar ideas to a reader of H.P. Lovecraft, and the game honestly does very well to implement these without feeling heavy-handed or flat-out plagiaristic about it. And like I say, what I've shown you here isn't all of it. There's a little more to find within this game, and I urge that you do so. So, to wrap this one up, I actually don't have a lot else to say. I really enjoyed my time spent with this game. The tension, the atmosphere, the presentation, it all looks and feels fantastic for what the developers were aiming for. Yeah, it's short, almost as short as Octave actually, and in some ways there are a few similarities in how the game chooses to direct the player, but the difference in focus and direction, and how much more effectively No One Lives Under The Lighthouse uses it, is completely undeniable. For anyone who enjoys a retro or horror experience, I absolutely recommend this game. It might not be revolutionary or anything incredibly unique, but it doesn't honestly need to be. Just put on a pair of headphones in a dark room and spend a few hours with it. Getting lost in the head of a 19th century lighthouse keeper having a bad time might just be worth your evening. So go play this game, a little gang of Caspers. And if you like the video, Drop kick your laptop, phone or tablet so that it bounces off the ground and subscribes you to the channel. Is that it? Did I did I do it right? Thank <laughs> you.